And so for me, this kind of uh, gets back to my roots as a molecular uh, chemist by training. So my PhD was uh, in studying uh, the mechanisms of formation of uh, small phosphorus containing molecules. So I wanna start there uh, today. So when we think about a molecule, when we think about the idea of designing a synthesis, we always start with the structure. Say I want to design a synthesis of this little cluster here, ASP3. Well, anybody that's taken an organic chemistry course would know you would start with a retrosynthetic analysis. So let's disconnect this target molecule. And so maybe I would disconnect it like this. I would make a P3 ring and an arsenic three plus fragment. And then I would need to figure out some way to make this P3 three minus ring. So maybe I would support it by a transition metal fragment and then maybe I would figure out a way to make that fragment from some available starting materials like white phosphorus and this niobium dichloride species. And so then you go into the lab, you uh, put the things on the right in a, in a flask and you see if you, uh, you know, can actually uh, redesign the synthesis. And if you're lucky, it works and uh, you get a beautiful paper out of it. And so as a synthetic chemist by training, this is, you know, how I think that there's this, uh, inextricable connection between structure and mechanism. And so when I got into this field, uh, working with John Owen as a postdoc, I hit a roadblock right away. And that's that you can't really draw the structure, the atom level structure of a quantum dot. Um, we have some idea from electron uh, microscopy that these things are composed of crystalline inorganic cores, but maybe they're riddled with stacking faults or maybe they have unusual structure types. Um, and then we have some fuzzy knowledge of the surfaces, uh, at least from the electron microscopy images, that white space that separates the dots is, you know, sort of keeping these things kinetically stable. But we really don't know what, with atom level precision, what the surface looks like. Um, John DeRue just told us about uh, all of the uh, analytical tools using NMR spectroscopy to analyze that surface chemistry. But I would say, uh, even if that gives us a good sense for how to manipulate the surfaces, it still doesn't give us that atom level. So um, one thing that you can imagine doing in, in the world of quantum dot, uh, chemistry is instead of starting with a structure and going after a mechanism, maybe deducing a mechanism and backtracking a structure. And so that's kind of the thing that uh, uh, we and many others have been doing in this field. So um, how do we start with uh, making our little quantum dots. So of course, we all know our favorite uh, synthetic tool is colloidal synthesis. And here we're gonna start with simple molecular precursors. Hopefully you purify your precursors first so you really know what you're putting into your flask. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, you know, we're using technical grade reagents. And so there's mystery compounds that can really influence the synthesis. We can vary things like time, uh, temperature or concentration. Um, and what takes place in the flask, uh, unless we go after it, uh, is really a black box. Um, through empirical optimization, we can get out really nice looking nanocrystals. Um, and this kind of gets us to this roadmap of connecting technology requirements like in quantum dot uh, land, um, things like narrow line width, high quantum yield, high stability, um, back to our scientific objectives of minimizing ensemble heterogeneity and controlling interfaces. And kind of getting to this point really comes back to this idea of mechanism. We need to understand the mechanism by which these nanocrystals grow to make them as well as we need for our specific technology applications. Um, and we need to be able to manipulate their structures with atom level precision. So today what we're gonna do is talk about what we know about how these little nanocrystals grow in solution um, and especially focus on so-called non-classical or sort of uh, more comp slightly more complicated classical mechanisms. Uh, but of course, to get us all on the same foot, let's start at the very beginning with the traditional classical mechanism as envisioned by Lemaire and Deiniger. So uh, many of you have probably seen this plot. This is a plot of time uh, as a function uh, a monomer concentration that is as a function of time. And so what we have here is three distinct regimes of, that define uh, the quantum dot synthesis uh, in a traditional uh, cadmium selenide synthesis, for example, where we have monomer concentration building up, uh, peaking, and then going down. And these three um, time periods are broken down into precursor conversion, nucleation, and growth. So in the first regime, precursor conversion, we're slowly building up our monomer concentration through a steady 
conversion of these uh, molecular precursors. Um, we then reach uh, sort of a critical concentration uh, near supersaturation. And at this point, the rate of nucleation skyrockets and a large population of nuclei are basically simultaneously born. So this is that burst nucleation that we uh, all know and love. And as these nuclei uh, then begin to grow, um, the supersaturation is driven downward, monomer concentration drops, and that arrests further nucleation. So you just enter a steady growth regime uh, until you reach chemical equilibrium. And so many experiments have qualitatively confirmed this behavior and the sort of abstract graphic I have here um, and have identified the separate nucleation and growth stages defined by the Lemaire type model. Let's look at this in a sort of a, another kind of picture. So we have precursor conversion again, molecules converting to small little nuclei, nucleation happening quickly, and then I've separated growth into two steps. So in the first step of uh, growth, we have a, a time period in which we undergo size focusing. And then in a later time period, uh, we undergo so-called Oswald ripening. Let's first talk about this um, size focusing regime. In the size focusing regime, we can define uh, the diffusion controlled growth rate of a particle with a size r, so dr dt, the change in radius with time or the change in size with time. And this expression is derived from the Gibbs-Thompson equation, which relates the solubility of a nanocrystal to the bulk solid and surface energy. So it says that small crystals are in equilibrium with their liquid uh, at a lower temperature than larger crystals. And so from that uh, Gibbs-Thompson equation, we can deduce uh, this diffusion control growth rate. And so here K is proportional to the diffusion constant of monomers. Delta is the thickness of the diffusion layer. And at a fixed concentration, R star, that's the critical radius uh, uh, for which the solubility of the nanocrystal is exactly the concentration of the monomers in solution. So zero growth rate. Um, and so if we plot DRDT, what we get is this kind of uh, uh, growth rate as a function of R over R star uh, shown here. Uh, so the growth rate when the diffusion thickness is basically infinite. In this picture, at any given monomer concentration, there exists a critical size that's at equilibrium. And nanocrystals that are smaller than that critical size have negative growth rates, so they dissolve, and larger ones have growth rates that are dependent strongly on their size. And so we get focusing of size distributions in this regime when the nanocrystals present in solution are all slightly larger than the critical size. So under these conditions, the smaller nanocrystals in the distribution grow faster than the larger ones, so they can catch up. Um, once we kind of uh, start depleting our monomers uh, sufficiently um, due to growth, the critical size becomes larger than the average size present in solution. And so the distribution now uh, broadens because some of the smaller nanocrystals are shrinking and they eventually disappear while larger ones are still growing. And so this is called Oswald ripening or defocusing. And of course you can refocus the distribution by uh, injecting additional monomers um, at the growth temperature, uh, which will shift the critical size back to the smaller value. Um, okay, so this is sort of the picture that we should have in our head when we think about classical monomer by monomer or molecule by molecule or atom by atom uh, growth. So we can have both uh, burst-like nucleation, we can have size focusing, and we can have size defocusing. So how do modern syntheses achieve the conditions to satisfy this classical Lemaire model? Modern syntheses achieve these conditions by using nanocrystal precursors that slowly convert to crystal monomers at a rate that limits the crystallization. So here, the rate of monomer supply to the reaction during nucleation determines the number of nanocrystals produced. So if we can tune the precursor conversion kinetics precisely, the number of nanocrystals can be uh, used to control the size of the nanocrystals at full reaction conversion. And so one of my favorite examples from this comes from the Owen lab uh, several years ago now, where they developed this beautiful library of thiourea precursors uh, for preparing lead sulfide um, that are variously substituted to change their relative rates of reaction. 
And so here uh, we have, for example, the cyano substituted um, biourea versus this methoxy substituted biourea spanning about five orders of magnitude in um, uh, conversion kinetics. And so this change in precursor conversion kinetics really does dictate the uh, crystallization of these materials. So the more reactive cyano substituted biourea generates a larger number of nuclei. And so uh, if you keep the amount of material of uh, cadmium and uh, lead and sulfur in your reaction pot the same, uh, then you're going to generate uh, smaller nanocrystals because you have more nuclei. Uh, whereas with the less reactive precursor, you generate fewer nuclei. And so uh, you end up with larger nanocrystals at full conversion. Uh, so this is a really beautiful way to get monodisperse uh, size uniform ensembles of uh, colloidal quantum dots by using precursor gated um, chemistry uh, to control your crystallization. All right, so uh, I'm going to go through a series of uh, fun questions throughout my talk today just to keep everyone awake. And so uh, my first uh, is comes with a video. And the question is, why do these crystals grow in a wide variety of sizes? So here we have a watch glass that contains a solution of potassium ferricyanide, so just a molecule. Um, and you can see the crystals growing as the solution concentrates. And so the answers, the possible answers uh, that I came up with are A, this is a non-classical, not atom uh, by atom or molecule by molecule crystal growth process, or B, this is a classical model, molecule by molecule growth uh, mechanism, but nucleation and growth are not separate in time. What do you guys think? A or B? You can uh, feel free to throw it in the chat or um, uh, just think about it to yourself. So it turns out that in this particular case, uh, potassium ferricyanide is growing via a classical molecule by molecule uh, mechanism. But of course, nucleation and growth are not separate in time. So at the uh, very beginning of the video, if I click back, um, what you could see is that nuclei are sort of forming uh, over a large period of time. New crystals are being born throughout the entire reaction. And so all of the crystals sort of have a different growth history. Um, and so you're getting a uh, uh, sort of nucleation and growth happening simultaneously, and that leads to broad size distributions. And this, so this is, if you're ever grown rock candy, for example, this is a kind of crystallization that you'll be familiar with. All right, so now that we understand a little bit about classical crystallization, um, let's talk about non-classical crystallization. So uh, here in this uh, plot, I have uh, ions, atoms, or molecules on the left, and I have our, our uh, bulk or nanocrystal on the right. And the mechanism that we just talked about is this monomer by monomer uh, crystal growth pathway shown here in gray. And so there's a wide variety of other potential uh, growth mechanisms out there. Um, and all of these that are so-called non-classical mechanisms are gonna involve some important intermediate species uh, that are required uh, to uh, affect the crystallization. So it turns out that in the wide world of oxide mineralization in particular, so the field of biomineralization, the concept of non-classical crystallization has been widely appreciated for decades. Um, for uh, if the first sort of hints of non-classical uh, crystallization in these materials are often found in TEM images uh, of the complex structures that result as a result of these sort of alternative uh, crystallization pathways. So we can see here, for example, anatase TiO2 that has perfect alignment after apparent attachment uh, uh, of two uh, distinct crystals. Uh, we have, for example, um, magnetite crystals growing through uh, accretion of disordered very hydrite-like nanoparticles. Um, so lots of different kinds of possibilities uh, that involve sort of distinct crystallites or intermediates that attach to form ultimately perfect single crystals. So um, it turns out that when we wanna hunt for uh, non-classical mechanisms in the field of colloidal quantum dots, it's often a little bit harder. Sometimes we get hints from TEM that there's something different going on, uh, but sometimes uh, you know, we just end up with a perfect spherical uh, nanocrystal at the end and there's no hint that uh, a non-classical mechanism was occurring. Um, 
So often uh, UV vis spectroscopy is one of the first places to find uh, evidence for something interesting going on in your mechanism. So uh, here I'm showing the very uh, uh, classic picture of uh, cadmium selenide quantum dot growth uh, from aliquots uh, taken from the reaction of cadmium selenide quantum dot growth over time, uh, published in the seminal Murray Buendi paper in 1993. And what you can see here is uh, the nanocrystals are sort of slowly growing in a continuous kind of way. This is in contrast uh, to some other cases where the growth is seemingly non-continuous. So for example, in the synthesis of wartzite structured cad selenide nano rods, uh, originally reported by David Kelly's group, um, what they observed is the formation of this really prominent feature in the UV vis spectrum uh, that disappeared as these larger uh, wartzite nanorods appeared. You can see similar uh, types of uh, characteristic uh, absorption features in uh, examples from 3,5 nanocrystals as well. So for example, this conversion of indium phosphide quantum dots uh, growing at the expense of some well-defined uh, species that has a characteristic uh, absorption spectrum. Similarly, uh, indium arsenide quantum dots uh, appear to have some small, uh, high energy absorbing species at early time points in their reactions. Uh, so uh, in all of these cases, uh, clusters, uh, particular small, uh, sort of oligomers or organized arrangements of uh, monomer units have been implicated as being intermediates in the synthesis of these particular nanocrystals. And these clusters often appear, as you see here, as distinct peaks in the UV vis spectrum with defined, well-defined energies. So some of these clusters have been uh, fully characterized using um, different structural techniques like single crystal X-ray diffraction, or a pair distribution function analysis of powder diffraction data. So I'm showing a few examples here, these cadmium selenide pyramids, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, um, uh, originally structurally characterized by the Owen lab, uh, as well as this indium phosphide cluster uh, shown here, originally characterized by my lab. But this uh, uh, ability to define with atom level precision what these structures are is still sort of at the very early stages of our field. Um, and so it's not necessary to understand the importance of these things in, in, the, in syntheses. And so it's becoming increasingly uh, uh, well appreciated that clusters exist uh, potentially in many cases on a continuous reaction landscape with larger uh, nanostructures. So for example, uh, in this beautiful paper from Dimitri Talapin's lab published in 2019, uh, 2020, um, they were looking at zinc selenide uh, uh, nanocrystal formation, and they uh, observed that simply by tuning the reaction temperature, they could get into regimes where they stabilized clusters or wires or platelets or larger nano uh, structures. And so uh, clusters as sort of a universal uh, species on a complex reaction landscape is something that I think is becoming more and more um, uh, appreciated. All right, so the thing we want to address today is how do these clusters convert to larger nanocrystals? And so here's my sort of uh, organization for the rest of this talk. We're going to go through four case studies looking at the conversion of cluster intermediates to larger nanocrystals. A first mechanism that we'll talk about is quantized growth or so-called layer by layer growth, where you start with some cluster seed and then you grow the, uh, the material sort of one layer at a time from that seed. An alternative mechanism would be cluster assembly, where you're growing uh, your nanostructure by attachment of individual clusters. And then a fourth type of mechanism will involve uh, dissolution uh, or part, either full or partial dissolution of your cluster uh, and renucleation to give you uh, quantum dot material. So let's start uh, with quantized growth or layer by layer growth as our first uh, case study. Um, so this beautiful paper from uh, David Norris's lab published earlier this year um, made a really nice connection between uh, discrete or quantized growth in uh, these little semiconductor clusters and to what's observed in uh, layer by layer growth of semiconductor platelets. Um, so this discrete type of growth is contrasted with the continuous growth that we typically think about when we think about monomer by monomer addition uh, in the growth of conventional, say, cadmium selenide quantum dots or lead sulfide quantum dots, as I showed you in the John Owen example. 
And so in this discrete uh, growth, um, we have uh, essentially that materials can only grow in monolayer increments. Materials with partial layers or other arrangements are basically unstable relative to that complete layer. And so this is quite distinct from uh, this uh, idea of monomer by monomer growth where sizes that are just a few atoms different, uh, smaller or larger, really don't have big differences in uh, their uh, energetics. So one of the first observations of this sort of quantized or discrete growth came uh, in the area of cadmium selenide uh, nanostructures. And it was from Livero's group uh, in 2007. And what they observed is this beautiful UV vis spectrum uh, where uh, they would see this series of sort of spikes uh, in the UV vis spectrum over time uh, with the uh, spikes at higher energies sort of decreasing in intensity as the spikes at uh, uh, lower energies grew in intensity. Uh, so you can plot the evolution of each of the populations over time and indeed see that uh, uh, they seem to be uh, coming in and out at the expense of one another. And importantly, the individual cluster sizes are stable and don't undergo ripening. So you don't see any sort of red or blue shift of each of these individual uh, species associated with these spikes in the UV vis spectrum. Uh, they simply disappear to give rise to the next larger species. And so um, the key uh, to this type of cluster synthesis uh, originally was thought to be sort of the use of mild temperatures um, and reactive precursors that um, uh, sort of react very uh, rapidly. Now, uh, we've also been able to see that this kind of quantized growth can actually be sustained out to quite large sizes. So rather than um, kind of terminating this kind of layer by layer or quantized pattern at around two nanometers, you can actually sustain quantized growth out to three, three, three and a half or four uh, nanometer size cadmium selenide clusters. Um, uh, simply by really carefully controlling your reaction concentrations. So the question is, what exactly is going on uh, in these UV vis spectrum? What are the mechanisms going on to convert uh, the species characterized by each of these spikes in the UV vis? And so a few years ago, John Owen's group looked at this quantized growth uh, mechanism in a little bit more detail. And what they found um, was that if they took cadmium carboxylate and uh, this TMS selenide, those two reagents reacted quantitatively uh, to make cadmium selenide upon mixing uh, in the presence of amine, and they did so at room temperature or below. And so in order to actually monitor this reaction, uh, they turned the temperature way down and they monitored uh, the UV vis in situ. So you can see here at minus 42 degrees, there's sort of one uh, more or less uh, well-defined uh, UV vis pattern that's seen. And then if you step the temperature up now to zero degrees Celsius, you see another species up here. And then if you turn the temperature up to 22 degrees, you see yet another species up here. And interestingly, the interconversion of these UV vis spectra occur with these perfect isospecific uh, like behavior. So these isospecific points um, observed when the reaction is slowed uh, at these low temperatures um, led to the conclusion that the component spectra, so the individual spectra, are representative of single quantum dots and that the conversion must be occurring without any other intermediates uh, building up in concentration. So this behavior really demonstrates the reaction's extraordinary selectivity for specific products um, that inhibit local thermodynamic minima and therefore are likely to have atomically precise structures. So here you can see that um, at 22 degrees, they stabilize uh, the uh, product that has a lowest energy electronic transition at 350 nanometers. And they could actually um, uh, increase the temperature and get larger sizes from there that could be perfectly isolated from the reaction mixture. So because they could actually isolate these larger sized uh, species that uh, were stable at room temperature or above, they could actually define with atom level precision using uh, structural characterization tools what these clusters were. And so in the case of the smallest size, the CAD selenide 350, so the one defined by the lowest energy transition at 350 nanometers, they were able to get a low resolution single crystal X-ray diffraction structure, which told them 
uh, that the structure uh, involved a perfect pyramid of cadmium and selenium units. Um, the surface chemistry wasn't defined given the low resolution of the uh, data. But that um, uh, picture of the inorganic core allowed uh, them to fit powder diffraction data. So the um, pair distribution function basically gives you a histogram of interatomic distances as a Fourier transform of your um, powder diffraction data. And uh, you can see here in red that the fits to these pair distribution function analysis data with this type of pyramidal structure is really good. And so then they could um, build a model uh, for the larger sizes that just include uh, completion of one individual layer, uh, addition of one individual layer to these pyramids. And they could see that the PDF data uh, associated with the powder diffraction of these samples really fit quite perfectly. What's more is knowledge of each of these little quantum dots structure allowed for precise analysis of the size dependence of the Bain gap um, at these really tiny sizes. And so you can see here this uh, traditional plot of uh, diameter uh, versus energy, energy versus diameter. And um, by basically plotting an effective radius uh, for these tetrahedra um, against the energy of the lowest energy electronic transition, uh, what they saw is that these little clusters really do exist on a continuous curve with larger quantum dots as defined by uh, others in the field many, many years ago. And so these really are the smallest uh, versions of quantum dot and they can be defined uh, with this atom level specificity. So um, this kind of shows us a snapshot in time of how these clusters are growing. So we know that they're growing with the completion of one individual layer. Um, but it really still doesn't get down to the mechanism. How are those layers being completed? And so um, David Norris group uh, in a Jack's paper this year um, sort of really got down to the nitty gritty of how these uh, tetrahedra grow. So here I'm showing a tetrahedral shaped cad selenide cluster um, with an edge length of five, and it's gonna be growing uh, to the next size that has an edge length of six. And um, the model that they're using here to explain this is sort of a 2D um, nucleation of an individual monolayer on a facet. And so uh, here you can see in purple, the monomers at the step edge of this growing two-dimensional island, um, they're gonna be much, much higher in energy than the other surface monomers, which are shown in orange. And so completion of a 2D island leads to the next uh, larger size uh, magic size cluster. They also looked in detail at the free energy of uh, the magic size clusters uh, by combining both uh, ideas from 3D and 2D nucleation theories. Um, so the different magic size cluster or cluster sizes, so the complete tetrahedra, are uh, shown in these dots here. Um, and they're connected via transition states, these sort of red curves. Um, where a 2D island has not yet completed a new facet. And so what you see here is that these transitions, transition states are high in energy. Uh, and so there's a lot of um, uh, uh, barrier associated with going from uh, one size to another. And there's, uh, it turns out that these barriers are actually size dependent at uh, various uh, nanocrystal sizes. Um, okay. Yeah, so sort of this 2D island growth uh, with monomers at the step edge being very reactive relative to other monomers that are sort of protected uh, is kind of the model that we have now in our head for understanding these uh, sort of layer by layer growth. So in the way that I've just described it, is layer by layer or quantized growth non-classical? So sh I'm showing here in this uh, video another example of layer by layer growth. And uh, what you can see is that basically an individual layer of this growing silicon nanowire is deposited simultaneously. And so the answers, possible answers are yes, it proceeds through distinct higher nuclearity intermediates, or no, it, uh, let me replay the video if I can, or no, um, it relies on classical ideas of supersaturation, nucleation, and atom by atom or molecule by molecule growth. So uh, 
can kind of think the answer to yourself. And uh, the answer here, it actually turns out is that quantized growth or this layer by layer growth can really be understood uh, from a classical picture. So uh, cluster intermediates can be involved in growth and the mechanism can still be classical. Um, so we can kind of uh, separate uh, uh, cluster based mechanisms into two bins now. So we have monomer driven uh, cluster growth processes. So like seeded growth, quantized growth or layer by layer growth and continuous growth. Um, and then sort of in the most clearly non-classical bin, we have uh, cluster attachment processes uh, or assembly processes. Uh, so let's talk about this cluster assembly process in our next case study. So one thing that's been sort of universally seen in uh, uh, trying to engender these sort of uh, uh, class, uh, non-classical attachment uh, mechanisms is uh, the use of really high concentrations um, and the approach uh, uh, to sort of a dense or organic phase. So colloidal nanoparticles synthesized at high concentrations really accentuate unique surfactant behavior, um, which can lead to the formation of really high purity uh, magic sized clusters or clusters stabilized within um, these organic uh, phases. So in an example here, uh, what we're seeing are uh, cadmium calcogenine magic, magic sized clusters stabilized within a highly ordered hexagonal uh, sort of mesophase assembly. And so you get these kind of fibrous uh, assemblies of clusters. And uh, the idea here is that these would be templated um, from uh, some structure that's inherent to the organic uh, phase that it's being templated in. So this uh, suggests uh, a mechanism for stabilization of these clusters uh, in which the organic material is sort of shielding the particles from further growth. And so if you can get the organic material out of the way now, uh, there would be a sort of driving force for fusion or attachment of these clusters. All right, so uh, using uh, organic mesophases would be a way to both prepare at high uh, purity these clusters and to stabilize them, uh, but to uh, then uh, undergo uh, particle fusion, we need to get them out of the way. So one of the earliest examples of using this kind of uh, buffets or uh, organic, uh, inorganic template uh, to grow uh, inorganic nanocrystals was explored by Bill Burroughs' lab. So similar to what we just described, um, this reaction starts with the formation of cadmium uh, salt, amine complex lamellar structure. So kind of layered structures of cadmium salts. Uh, prepared to serve as a template for the nucleation of cadmium selenide clusters. So these cadmium uh, X2 amine lamella uh, basically react uh, instantaneously with uh, the addition of a selenium precursor, in this case, selenourea. So now these uh, um, sort of lamellar arrangements of individual cad selenide clusters prepared in this way can be annealed to give rise to two-dimensional structures where the overall dimensions of uh, the lamellar template are sort of preserved in the two-dimensional structure of the resulting nanocrystal. And so uh, you can then take these kind of uh, ribbons and sonicate them and unbundle them to get individual CAD cell nine nanowires grown through this cluster fusion. And uh, what the Burrow group showed is that the diameter of these wires is ultimately uh, a function of the size of the original uh, clusters used to grow them. And so uh, they showed that this mechanism is completely general for a variety of 2,6 materials, including uh, zinc sulfide, zinc selenide, cad sulfide, cad selenide, cad telluride. So they all start with this sort of lamellar uh, template of metal salt that undergoes reaction with your group six precursor. And then um, some kind of uh, a stimulus is added, typically heat, to induce fusion of those individual clusters in that template. Now recently, um, this uh, kind of idea of using a lamellar template uh, to uh, hold clusters in place or uh, to start off with was sort of um, taken one step further by the Haiyan group. 
So they revisited this idea of uh, CAD selenide um, sort of cluster-based ribbons being uh, generated from uh, lamellar structures containing um, CAD selenide clusters. But now instead of using um, uh, monofunctional amines as the uh, uh, binding group to the CAD selenide clusters, uh, they instead used bifunctional amines. And so instead of engendering cluster fusion at higher temperatures, what they saw uh, was the amazing formation of these uh, two and three dimensional super lattices of um, cadmium selenide clusters that are now sort of held in place uh, covalently through uh, the presence of these amine uh, bidentate amine ligands. Uh, and so these cluster assemblies have really interesting optical properties uh, and I think is a really exciting direction uh, for um, taking sort of some of this cluster chemistry. So this is, uh, so what we've just talked about is the use of sort of organic or organometallic uh, mesophases to template the assembly of clusters and eventually their fusion to larger nanostructures. But we can also get cluster attachment not using inorganic or inorganic mesophase. Uh, and so that comes through the process called oriented attachment. This is was first observed in the quantum dot field in larger nanocrystals. So here I'm showing an example of lead selenide nanocrystals undergoing oriented attachment, uh, and they're they're starting at about 10 nanometers. Uh, so in this kind of series of TEM Im images, we start with the initial configuration of a hexagonally ordered two-dimensional array of lead selenide quantum dots. And all of these lead selenide quantum dots in this example are coated with hexylamine um, ligands. And so in situ heating of this sort of ordered array leads to a transition where the nanocrystals have higher mobility. So they become uh, quite disordered. And uh, nanoparticles eventually coalesce and there's uh, some initial sort of attachment process that takes place. In regions of quite low density of these quantum dots, you can get these kind of one-dimensional uh, ribbon-like structures. And in higher density regions, you get sort of larger area crystals. Now, um, uh, importantly uh, to this process of oriented attachment, within a time scale of minutes, the dots uh, begin to fuse into um, actual single crystals. Uh, so here we're just seeing uh, kind of random uh, agglomerate. Uh, but within this random agglomerate, two of these crystals have actually aligned their uh, lattice planes through some kind of rotational process. Um, and then over uh, uh, several more minutes, more of these um, crystallites come into registry with respect to their um, uh, 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 atomic arrangements. And so that process of oriented attachment is schematically shown here, where we begin with a sort of random attachment, rotation to align uh, specific crystal planes, rotation to actually align the actual three-dimensional structure, and then relaxation of the interface to kind of really uh, uh, result in that single crystal state. I encourage you to go check out uh, this nano letters paper. There's some beautiful snapshot videos in the TEM showing the rotation of these nanocrystals, and you can really see the uh, crystal planes come into alignment. Um, and so this original fusion process is, of course, driven by the reduction in surface energy to lower uh, overall energy of the system. Um, but the actual driving force for alignment of these crystal planes is something that's still a little uh, less well understood. Nevertheless, uh, this type of oriented attachment mechanism has been uh, widely applied, especially in the case of more ionic nanocrystals like lead calcogenides, uh, to access a wide variety of structures. So showing here um, are some much smaller, uh, we'll call them clusters, of uh, lead calcogenides, lead sulfide. These are about two nanometer lead sulfide clusters uh, being used as the starting materials. And so what's special about these lead sulfide clusters is that they have exposed reactive 110 facets that serve as the points of fusion. And so uh, during this fusion process, uh, this actually occurs through fusion of individual edges of these uh, lead sulfide clusters. And um, what's obtained in the end of these uh, fusion reactions are these very large area um, uh, square-like uh, two-dimensional uh, 
plates of lead sulfide. Um, so two-dimensional structures are believed to be obtained because um, uh, the organic surfactants uh, uh, present in the system are highly or are present as a highly ordered monolayer on the top 100 surfaces, which are preventing three-dimensional growth. Um, this is the same type of um, stabilization mechanism that is often found when you uh, sort of bottom up monomer by monomer synthesize um, uh, colloidal nanoplatelets. But here you're getting it uh, through uh, sort of uh, migration of the ligands to these more, sta uh, uh, more stable 100 uh, facets from these more reactive 110 facets. Right, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so time for another uh, fun question and video. And so the question is, what non-classical process was captured for the very first time in this video? So this is a great science paper from Jim Diorio's lab. So in this part of the video, you're just seeing the nanoparticles coming into focus in a liquid cell, TEM. And the question uh, is really about what's happening in this next part. And so the options are aggregation, oriented attachment, or quantized growth. And so hopefully, based on all of the discussion we've just had, uh, uh, it's evident to you that this is uh, uh, showing uh, the first example of uh, live captured uh, oriented attachment, where you see an individual crystal kind of uh, being attracted uh, through some uh, dipolar force uh, to an adjacent nanocrystal and then attaching, rotating, uh, and uh, eventually fuse, um, uh, generating a, a perfect single crystal. All right, so the last um, case study I want to walk through is the use of clusters as sort of monomer reservoirs um, to grow uh, larger quantum dot structures. And so the idea of clusters existing as sort of an off path um, intermediate uh, in nanocrystal growth uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, was uh, perhaps for the first time implicated uh, by David Kelly's group in the formation of these Wurtzite cad selenide nanorods. So um, this particular cad selenide cluster shown here is like one of these pyramids characterized by the Owen lab. And so it has a tetrahedral zinc blend like structure. Um, and so you might imagine that for it to serve as a um, precursor to Wurtzite structured cad selenide nanorods, it might have to dissolve or undergo go some uh, dissociation process to give rise to these larger materials. And so the kinetics of this process were investigated uh, in great detail by David's group. And what they saw was indeed that the clusters appeared and disappeared as the uh, nanorods grew in. And in particular, uh, they showed that um, these clusters were in equilibrium uh, with the cad selenide monomers in solution. And this is what limited monomer saturation in the system and gave rise to these nanorods. Now, this idea of uh, cad selenide clusters existing as sort of off path or um, uh, solute limiting intermediates uh, is sort of unique uh, to this nanorod uh, example. Typically in cad selenide nanocrystal synthesis, um, clusters haven't been widely implicated as being important intermediates. But that's definitely not the case uh, when it comes to indium phosphide quantum dots. And so um, the first kind of hints that something weird was going on in the world of indium phosphide quantum dot synthesis came from this paper uh, in 2009 from Xiaogong Peng's group, where they were specifically asking the question, do monomers convert to indium phosphide nanocrystals through conventional nucleation and growth, classical nucleation and growth, or through some other mechanism? And um, what they did was monitor the reaction kinetics uh, using a combination of NMR spectroscopy. So they watched the disappearance of the trimethylsilylphosphine uh, precursor and the appearance of a specific size indium phosphide on um, what they call cluster or quantum dot. And all of their data basically showed that uh, a classical nucleation and growth model did not explain this data. Now the uh, sort of uh, caveat to that conclusion is that um, 
while they were implicating simple chemical kinetics to explain uh, this nucleation and growth, um, the product that they were observing the formation of is actually one of these molecular cluster species. So you're taking precursors and growing a molecular cluster, so an atomically precise species. And so the idea that this would be happening through conventional chemical kinetics uh, is not too surprising, I think. And so uh, it took a few years for this connection to be made, but it ends up being that these particular clusters that have an absorption on uh, maximum at 386 nanometers are actually themselves Inter important intermediates to larger indium phosphide quantum dots. And so over the last several years, my group's been really studying this uh, process in great detail. And what we found is that uh, if you take indium carboxylates and silophosphines and combine them with carboxylic acids, you end up making indeed these little clusters that Xia Gongpeng first saw uh, in his uh, 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 mechanism study. And these exist on a continuous reaction landscape with larger indium phosphide quantum dots. So an interesting question uh, is, what's the structure of these indium phosphide clusters and how do they convert um, to indium phosphide quantum dots? So here's the single crystal X-ray diffraction structure of these indium phosphide clusters. Uh, they have an composition of indium-37, phosphorus-20, uh, with 51 carboxylates. And what's interesting about them is that they don't have a regular tetrahedral structure like has been seen for the 2,6 clusters that have been characterized. They have a sort of low symmetry C2V structure. And in, in, uh, in order to crystallize uh, this particular cluster, we grew this uh, crystal using phenylacetate ligands. So these phenylacetate ligands they're still alkyl carboxylates, um, but the terminal phenyl group sort of limits the number of degrees of freedom uh, in the ligands, uh, allowing us to grow a single crystal. We can confirm using, uh, for example, NMR spectroscopy as well as TEM analysis uh, and other methods that when we put long chain fatty acids on these clusters, um, we indeed get exactly the same cluster. The UV vis spectrum is identical. Uh, we can see the sort of uh, asymmetric football-like shape in the TEM uh, that they form perfect super lattices, suggesting they are indeed, uh, you know, single uh, mo molecular species. Um, and so, in thinking about uh, what this structure is and how it converts to larger nanocrystals, uh, let's look in a little bit more detail at the physical structure of the fused inorganic core that's hiding within this organic shell of ligands. And so what you see here uh, are indium and phosphorus atoms uh, fused into a series of six-membered rings. So all of them form these six-membered rings. And normally when you think about um, sp3 hybridized atoms, so uh, main group atoms uh, that are arranged in six-membered rings, you normally think about two possible stable conformations. That's chairs and boats. And actually these six membered rings here in this indium phosphide cluster structure are twisted boats. So uh, a little bit of a high energy uh, arrangement for um, uh, tetrahedral atoms. Uh, so if we look at this particular unit here of indium, the indium phosphide cluster and we color all of those atoms uh, carbon, uh, that molecule would be known as twistane. That's a known hydrocarbon uh, structure. And if we put a bunch of these twist stains together, as shown in this blue uh, uh, fragment here, that thing, if we call it all those atoms carbon, would be called polytwistane. And that's a hypothetical carbon nanotube structure that folks have been sort of hunting for a little while. And so what this cluster uh, is, is really a series of intersecting tubes of polytwistane. And this uh, was kind of a useful realization to us uh, because it uh, suggested that there's a higher symmetry fragment hiding within this low symmetry cluster. And so uh, this is an excerpt of this uh, bigger cluster that has a much higher symmetry. Um, it has T symmetry, uh, which is not tetrahedral, TD, um, but is close. And so this is really uh, the realization of this kind of core in here, this T symmetry core, uh, really gave us a hint to how these clusters were forming in the first place. So here's our uh, a small little indium phosphide protonucleus that has perfectly tetrahedral atoms. And if we want to complete this little adamantane-like cage, the next connection we're going to make is to connect these two um, phosphorus atoms here in orange with an indium. We do that, we are building the pure tetrahedral zinc blend structure. 
Now, if instead we start with this little indium phosphide protonucleus and we connect two indium atoms on the diagonal with a phosphorus, we instead get these um, uh, twisted six-membered rings that give rise to this uh, magic size cluster phase. And so in our case, we think this might be happening because we're using carboxylate ligands only, which um, can serve as bridging ligands between adjacent indiums. We have a high density of ligands on the surface because of the stoichiometry of our uh, uh, nanoparticles. And we're using really reactive sources of phosphide. So um, this can sort of kinetically trap uh, you in that, uh, to this sort of pathway. Um, and so now the question is, how do you get from this twisted phase back to tetrahedral indium phosphide quantum dots. And so we've studied this mechanism in kind of gory detail and I don't wanna uh, belabor the point too much. So I know I'm coming up to the end of my time here. Um, uh, but so what we found is that uh, the clusters indeed do dissolve, but the dissolution is a lot more complex than we would have imagined. So it turns out that it's accelerated by the addition of uh, additional carboxylate, which was a, a first surprise because just thinking about Le Chatelier's principle, we would have thought that dissociation of carboxylate might have been the first step in this process. But it turns out that that carboxylate is needed to stabilize resulting cluster fragments that gen are generated from the first step in the dissolution. And if you uh, sort of run this reaction of just thermalizing pure clusters at relatively low temperatures below about 250 degrees, um, you get a relatively low yield of indium phosphide quantum dots. Um, so a lot of your indium phosphide material ends up just decomposing and not giving you a uh, productive uh, uh, solute that can crystallize to indium phosphide. Whereas if you're at temperatures above about 250 degrees, you can productively convert all of the species that are generated from this uh, cluster fragment into indium phosphide quantum dots. And so this idea that the cluster dissolution might be a bit complex from this oddly uh, structured uh, starting material isn't so surprising. Um, so Heather Kulik uh, from MIT did some really nice uh, first principles DFT uh, evaluation of the surface dependent growth uh, energetics of this cluster. And what she found is that um, different sites on the cluster have very different um, reactivity with molecular precursors. Uh, so for example, there are some sites that are quite reactive and there are some sites that are quite stable. And so the idea that um, the cluster might sort of uh, heterogeneously fragment uh, maybe isn't so surprising given that. Okay, so I've basically shown you two kinds of clusters uh, that we know uh, have structurally characterized. So I've shown you the tetrahedral uh, structures from the Owen group uh, and the sort of weird twisted phase that we saw in indium phosphide from my group. And one thing that I kind of want to put into your head as we come to the end of the talk is, what about other uh, cluster structures? You know, given that we found this weird one, are there other possibilities? And so I remember when I was a postdoc in John's lab, um, reading a really beautiful paper by Ruth Pachter from the, um, uh, the Naval Research Lab. And she had this like amazing, um, database of CAD selenide clusters that she had theoretically investigated. Uh, and this paper was uh, followed up a few years later uh, by the one that I'm citing here. And so she implicates a wide variety of other possible cluster uh, structure types. So for example, uh, these particular um, clusters that have been characterized by these sort of doublet features in the UV vis spectrum uh, and are viewed as precursors to nanoplatelets. Uh, so the ones that we saw from Bill Burroughs' lab, for example, are suggested from her calculations to actually be these sort of flattened, uh, kind of pancake-like uh, clusters, not like the tetrahedra that uh, John's lab characterized. Uh, additionally, she sees really strong evidence for uh, these types of barrel-like uh, clusters being potentially quite stable. Um, in any case, uh, all of these types of clusters, uh, if they exist, are going to be um, uh, are going to have surface chemistry playing an important role in their stabilization. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity for hunting for other types of cluster structures and imagining uh, them as the product we want to target, and thinking about 
how we would approach the synthesis. So going back to my very first slide uh, of the talk. So the last thing I wanna leave you with is uh, kind of asking the question, what controls mechanism? And if we can answer this question, we can really get to real deterministic design of these little semiconductor nanocrystals. And so what we've seen today is that mechanism is determined by a lot of different competing factors. So things like the reaction conditions, the ligands, the surface chemistry, the chemical potential or the concentration, the solubility, uh, temperature, Structural elements play an important role. So the steric environment in which your uh, evolving uh, material finds themselves in, the ability to form coordination networks on the surface of a growing nanocrystal, um, for example. And then something I didn't touch on as much, uh, but I wanna make sure I, I leave you with now is bonding type. So I mentioned that we see oriented attachment for very ionic lattices. Um, and that that's a less common mechanism for more covalent species is not too surprising. Uh, so think about diamond. Crystallizing diamond, as we know, takes high temperatures and high pressures typically. And so, um, you know, observing sort of uh, diamond nanocrystal oriented attachment at mild temperatures would be a pretty surprising type of mechanism. So whether or not you have a very ionic lattice where um, uh, electron sharing uh, in the bonding is not uh, a big uh, uh, part of the bonding description um, versus a more covalent uh, picture is certainly going to play an important role in uh, sort of the mechanistic pathway that these nanocrystals follow. So with that, I'm going to conclude and say that uh, hopefully I've told you a little bit about how uh, colloidal nanocrystals nucleate and grow from classical mechanisms, uh, monomer by monomer, um, to uh, sort of our emerging understanding of non-classical mechanisms, including a variety of cluster-based um, mechanisms.